So we have we have uh, um, our second week in a row, second week in a row where uh, we're not doing a battle with um, uh, with numbers because we only have. I can see Michaela st- smiling because she knows she knows it's in the bag. Although I'm gonna have to wait. I'm gonna have to. I don't think I'm gonna send it to Moscow. So I would love to hand deliver it, but since that's not an option right now, um, I've got to wait. You're gonna come back in January, right? No, I really do need to mail this. I'm doing thing. next semester online. Did you say you're not coming back? I'm doing next semester online. Online. Oh, so I, I wish I could give it to somebody to take to you. This was a lot. I don't know if people still do this, but for a long time, like if I was going back and forth to Russia, everybody wanted you to bring something. And I was like, I mean, one person, one person, um, you know, actually the, the provost at the university that I was at was like, oh, you have to bring for chocolates for, for my friend in Boston, you know, and, you know, I had to like bring these. And of course, I was like, you know, on the way back, we, we, we went, I can't, we did traveling on the way back, we went to Paris, we went to Tel Aviv. By the time these guys, I brought these chocolates back to Boston, I mean, he, I must have been delivering like, flat melted chocolates but everybody wants you to bring stuff back and forth i don't know if you've experienced this i'm sure you have and it, it's not even like expensive stuff it's token stuff to show that like you know you've you've given something so anyway i've got to figure out how, I, I suppose i'll mail it I'll, I'll just mail it i'll have to figure out to get it to you but anyway I'm give so you my- us address to mail it to otherwise i'm going to get it in like five months oh that that would be the best that would be great so Michaela gets Professor Hirota's, now I know from Jack that I have to move my head out of the way, Professor Hirota's beautiful Irish migration mug. So we have on the front, we have uh, the drawing of, of uh, immigrants gathering uh, in County Cork in Ireland, and on the back, the new memorial on Deer Island um, to uh, those who died on Deer Island um of uh, irish uh, migrants and michaela wins this because she's the only one to get this question 1852 the passenger law massachusetts passenger law right required ship captains to post a bond per passenger right uh and how much how much was that michaela a thousand dollars thousand dollars and that's in 1852 and how much would that be today i thought it was 1848 was it 1848 could be 1848 i think so <laughs> well, <I'm laughs> whatever i said double check. Wait. okay in any event it was a thousand dollars so what would be what would it what would it be you pu- plugged it into one of those online things i assume right what would it what would it be today it's about thirty two thousand dollars today. Thirty two thousand dollars. Can you imagine that per passenger? That's 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 the bond that they had to put up in case the state had to care for the passenger as a public charge. So that would really put a damper on things. But putting the whole risk um, on the um, on the captain side, although or on the the company's side, although um, I think they found ways about it around it. So today, congrat. Anyway, congratulations, Michaela. Give me an address and I will send it to you. It's a beautiful one and you will enjoy drinking out of it uh, next year when you're, when you are a uh, sophomore. Um, but it, you know, you earned it. And so today we have a gorgeous mug for Professor Temkin. Uh, Temkin. Moshik, what do you say? Do you say Temkin? Sorry, I was muted there. No I don't usually say my name. I just assume other people are going to say it. So <laughs> no, you, but do you say, you I want to say, say Tjomkin, but you say Temkin? Um, no, well, Tjomkin, if I'm my, for my Russian friends, I give that allowance. <laughs> okay, all right. But you go but with I'm Temkin. Among, that's really among friends. And, and in Israel, when you were growing up, it was Temkin? or what? It's Temkin. Temkin. All right, so Professor Temkin's beautiful mug. We have the, I got to move my head. We have a great picture of um, the funeral procession, the procession of sorrow, they called it, um, uh, after Sacco and Vanzetti's uh, execution, right? And you know why I love this picture so much? 
I love this picture so much because it's it's a, a bird's eye view of Scully Square, which is the West End, and it doesn't exist anymore. So you can actually see what Scully Square looked like, um, which is really nice. And on the back, I have this really nice. These are the the memorial armbands that were that were worn after the execution. That says "Remember Justice Crucified, August twenty second, nineteen twenty seven. So that is that is the mug um, uh, for this week, and it is a beautiful one. Okay, so I am going to introduce Professor Temkin. He is um, the Johnson and Johnson Chair in uh, Leadership and History at the Schwartzman College, uh, which is part of Tsinghua University. Um, he is also uh, a senior fellow fellow at the Belfer Center for Science uh, and International. Uh, affairs at Harvard University. Um, and he, this this book, wonderful book, um, I love doing the wave, um, you know, a, a good portion of which you guys read um, was, was really uh, made a real splash and was reviewed widely um, and was a finalist for the Kundil International Prize, which is sort of like um, a, a Nobel of sorts uh, or um, an Oscar, I'm not sure, choose your, uh, choose your, um, choose your prize, but a, a really pr big prize uh, in history put on by my alma mater, McGill University, right? Isn't that, isn't it McGill who, who sponsored? Yeah, and I want to say the reason I was a finalist and I didn't win is because that was a rigged process. Anti-Semitism. Right, no, no, it was, there were, there were irregularities, <laughs> okay. Um, never really fully investigated in my. That's opinion. right. Just, You're just demanding a recap. That. That how was your legal? Me. How was your legal team doing with that? Well, I let it drop. You know, I just. Uh, but that, that's my. I'm sticking to that position, Simon. <laughs> okay, I would have. I would have taken. I would have gone the anti-Semitism route. That's that, that's that's my fail safe. <laughs> um, and um, so it's a wonderful book, as you as you know, uh, and and a and a great read. Um, he's working on a couple of books now, uh, one on, um, uh, and really timely books, one on um, uh, surveillance, uh, surveillance and, and travel, uh, international travel and surveillance, and, um, and one on Malcolm X, um, uh, another important uh, intellectual with the, with the Boston uh, connection. Um, so that's Professor Temkin. We are really, really uh, fortunate to have him, especially since he's coming to us from Nantes, France, um, where his uh, where he's missing dinner, I'm sure. <laughs> so hopefully he's not in, in too much trouble. Well, not quite dinner. It's, it's only uh, it's only two p.m. But oh, it's only yes. two, right? Yeah, <laughs> yes, it's a six right. hour difference, not a twelve hour difference. <laughs> yeah, yes, right. I am in front. The reason that I'm I look oddly green is because of the time of day. It's the sun is hitting this sort of green tainted window above me. Um, otherwise I look like a normal, usually look like a normal person. Right now- I'm I can attest to that. But, but thank you for that. that. Thank you for that introduction. I got the time wrong. I was thinking we, so we had a brief talk last night where I, I was, uh, I was, I was taking away from dinner, but that wasn't at eight in the morning. So that's, that's my right. the source of my confusion. Yes. But he is, he is missing a siesta. So, <laughs> so we thank him for that. So I, I wanted, so I wanted to, to, uh, as a place to start, um, you know, your book is uh, focused mo mainly on um, on what the Sacco and Vanzetti trial uh, tells us about the United States and its relationship to the world uh, in the 1920s. Um, and, and, you know, you sort of say that the, uh, people have been looking at the Sacco and Vanzetti trial for, for a long time, since the trial itself, um, but a lot of the focus has been on, um, on whether they were guilty or not, right? Um, and you say, let's, let's put that aside because we'll never know. And let's see what the, how this trial was received. How do people respond? What does it tell us about the U.S. and the world um, at that time? Um, but before we get going on that, I thought maybe you could say a few words of who Sacco and Vanzetti were as people. Um, and especially, you know, what anarchism meant 
at that time. So, you know, people may have been be shaped, well, you guys are too young for 70s punk, but, uh, you know, I was gonna say people may be shaped by, by their understanding of, of uh, anarchism from uh, the punk movement, but which is now 50 years old, unbelievably. But, um, uh, but you know, what, what did anarchism mean in the 1920s when they, when they, you know, proudly declared themselves as anarchists? What did that mean? Okay. Well, I just quickly, I mean, um, I'll talk about anarchism in a, in a bit, but I'll just say quickly that anarchism back then meant pretty much what it means today. Uh, it's not, you know, there's a continuity there. You might be acquainted with anarchists, anarchist activity, whether it's in the U.S. or, uh, you know, other countries. And there's a, a, a philosophy behind that and a kind of a, a, a political approach, which is a revolutionary one. And I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a second, but specifically Sacco and Vanzetti, so the, you know, uh, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, they're two um, immigrants to the United States, uh, and they both arrive in the same year, 1908, and they, um, they don't actually know each other very well uh, at first, um, and uh, they're both, uh, you know, working class immigrants. They speak and work and live in Italian circles. Uh, uh, Sacco is a Sort of a, a, he has some skills. He's a he works in a shoe factory. He's a he's a heel trimmer in a shoe factory. And and Vanzetti works all kinds of menial jobs. He winds up selling fish in the streets uh, in different places, including Plymouth, but also in Boston, uh, because he likes to be outdoors talking to people. Uh, both of them live very modestly. Vanzetti is a is a what's known as a bat you know bachelor. He's not married. Sacco is a family man. He's he has he has a wife. He has he has a kid, uh, he lives in a little house, um, and they're youngish, you know, they're sort of in their, uh, in their late 20s, early 30s when this all starts. Um, and when, after they get to the US, they, uh, like a lot of people from their background, become very radicalized politically uh, because of what they perceive to be the injustice of, of uh, inequality in the United States, the exploitation of, of, of workers and poor people by capitalism by the, the ruling class uh, and they join up with the anarchist movement and specifically the sort of Italian version of the anarchist movement. So uh, these were guys who believed in overthrowing government. They, they, they believed that uh, uh, like all anarchists believe that the, the state is, a, is, a, is an inherently oppressive thing. Uh, the government is inherently oppressive uh, because it serves the interests of powerful of the powerful, um, and it and it and it persecutes the weak, right? Um, and specifically, they are uh, left. You know, the, there's two versions of there's like libertarians in the United States, and they're mostly on the right. Uh, but these are not libertarians; they're anarchists, so they're on the left, and so they believe in internationalism. They believe uh, they they despise uh, nationalism. Uh, they they despise jingoism. Uh, they believe that religion is oppressive generally. They believe that uh, we have uh, the need to live uh, in complete freedom. That is that human beings are fundamentally decent and good. Um, and if you sort of let them organize themselves, um, then they produce a just society, right? And in order to achieve that, they like anarchists around them believe that you need to actively work to overthrow the powers that be. Uh, uh, and that means joining up with groups that, uh, in some cases, were uh, engaged in violent activities like bombing buildings, um, you know, uh, things. Sometimes in the earlier years, they assassinated heads of state. They assassinated the, the president of France, Sadi Carnot. They assassinated the, the heiress of the, uh, of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Uh, they tried to, they assassinated the President McKinley in the United States in 1901. So these guys were very active. Uh, politically. Um, at the time that Sacco and Vanzetti join up with anarchism, I would say anarchism is already past its heyday. All right, so we're already looking at a period in which it's actually, if you're interested in radical politics, if you're a revolutionary, communism is on the rise. Communism, and especially sort of adhering to the ideas coming out of the Soviet Union, with Lenin, and the Bolshevik Revolution, th that's really the, the way that the revolutionaries are going and anarchism is kind of a little bit on the decline, but it's, they're still there and they're still active. So Sacco and Vanzetti have a double life. They're, they're, they're on the one hand, 
uh, you know, working class guys making a living, Sacco's raising a family, um, and uh, Vanzetti's just, you know, selling his fish. And then their other side of their life is they're very active in, in the anarchist world. That's great. Yeah, I I I love the stories about um, about both of them as as individuals. You know that that Sacco really just uh, wanted to get home to his family, right? That was that was clearly what he uh, what bothered him the most about the whole thing. Yeah, we don't think of revolutionaries that, but he was he was a revolutionary, but he also had a vegetable garden in the back of his house, which he yeah. tended to obsessively, and he had he was just a you know it was a he was a, a you know like a a family guy, right? He, yeah very and devoted I, to his wife and his child and then when he was in prison they you know uh, his he actually was arrested when his wife was pregnant with the second child so they had a second child um and and that's really what you know that's the duality of of at least you know of, of their lives and vanzetti's vanzetti's alibi which i also i also sort of love is that he, he was selling eels on the docks in plymouth to italians who buy them for buy them for the holidays right that's right yeah Really interesting. So to shift gears a little bit, you know, when you wrote this book, this was the height of the war on terror as- Well, I should add, uh, Simon, uh, sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to, I don't mean to interrupt you, but- No, please do, please do. I, I didn't, I didn't mention, so that's the background, but then of course what happens and the reason why we're, we're like here and now talking about it is because there was a crime, okay? So yes. um, they were um, arrested Okay, and then indicted and then convicted and then eventually executed for a robbery and murder that took place uh, in, uh, in 1920 uh, and their, tr their first trials in 1921. And this crime is a crime of banditry, right? So it happens in Braintree uh, outside of the factory where a paymaster and his guard are shot and killed and $15,000 that they carried are stolen, right? And for various reasons that kind of in a dragnet that the police did, Tzakun Vanzetti are arrested for this crime. Uh, and that's really what their case is. The case in which they're, they get kind of, you know, mixed up and become famous is through this case of a robbery and murder. But what's really important to point out, of course, Sacco and Vanzetti both deny their involvement uh, very forcefully. That's why it went all the way the way it did. Um, and uh, they have a lot of supporters for that. And it's a legal process before it's a political and global process. There's a criminal and legal process. What's really important to point out is that everything I said in the beginning about how political they were and their beliefs and their activity in anarchist circles and their you know desire to overthrow the government and so on, has nothing to do with the crime of which they're accused, which is a, a, a robbery and a murder, which is, it was, it's actually quite common, especially in that period, All right? There's no political overtone. They didn't assassinate a leader. They didn't bomb a building. It's, a, it's, a not, it's not a crime that anarchists were committing, sort of thing that anarchists were doing. So, th and so that gap between who they were both as individual, you know, family and individuals, and also who they were politically on all that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, the specific nature of this crime and the legal process that ensues, I think is what is the sort of spark that creates the Sacco Vanzetti affair. Yeah, and I mean, of course, the the judge himself, right, was uh, was caught or uh, saying to multiple times, you know, I'm I'm gonna to paraphrase, get those anarchist bastards, uh, 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 you know, that, that, that they, there were many who, who certainly viewed the need for punishment of them through the lens of their politics, right? So think about like, the, you know, just politics today, what it means in mainstream America to talk about the radical left or, you know, whatever, however you want to want to phrase it. Um, and the, the fact that they were anarchists and that they were revolutionaries uh, made them for a whole lot of people made them enemies of decent society, uh, enemies of the state. They were enemies of the state. I mean, they literally were enemies of the state, but it means also that that's the way they're going to be perceived by everybody. Even though the crime itself is not a 
crime of anarchism. It's a, it's a crime of, you know, like a, like just, you know, violent banditry. Okay. Um, and so their trial is suffused with political overtone. The judge is saying, constantly saying inappropriate political things. The prosecutor is saying political things about them. They themselves are saying pol political things in the courthouse which is irrelevant to their case, but just makes the jury hate them um, and the people outside as well. And it's the period after the, during the Red Scare, which means that this is a period in which the United States government is actively cracking down on these groups and deporting people uh, out of a fear of revolution. So that's why the, the trial becomes immediately contextualized and attached to this political situation. Jack um, wrote, I asked in the chat, oops, am I, I'm unmuted now, right? Yeah, sorry. Jack um, wrote in the chat, you know, does, does the sort of context, um, did this help to show that they had violent tendencies that, you know, to bolster their case? And I think that's absolutely the case, but not only that, but, you know, Vanzetti had been, tried on an earlier he was already in prison right on an earlier uh on an earlier um conviction right yeah. um yeah he so, had an earlier trial uh for a a, a, a different a different crime which he also de denied and had an alibi for uh, but was convicted um and this was very convenient for the prosecution in the sacco vanzetti joint trial because now vanzetti shows up as a convicted criminal with a record. Um, and, and that's especially important because there's no physical evidence connecting Vanzetti to the robbery and murder in Braintree at all. So um, there have been debates over the years about uh, whether they actually did it or not, and especially Sacco's connection to the, to the, to the actual crime. Uh, but, but there's been no, very little debate about Vanzetti himself, right? Um, but the, 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 the authorities treat them as inseparable, which I always found very odd. Like we think of Sacco and Vanzetti, but these are two individuals and they actually didn't know each other that well before they were arrested. Yeah. Like they moved in the same circles, but they're not like buddies. They're not like, a, it's not a duo. Yeah. They become attached once their, their trial begins and they're put together. Yeah. And they're not even in prison in, in together because Sacco is in, uh, Vanzetti had already been convicted, so he's in Dedham. Oh, uh, oh, and, sorry, in Charleston, in the in the in the prison uh, with the general population. And Sacco is because he's like in this process of appeals. He's still kept in isolation mm. um, in Dedham, so yeah. they only meet when they go to death row. Mm -hmm. Up till then, That's they're the first time meeting. Well, no, they met. They met in the courthouse when they're on trial together. Yeah, but they didn't like. They don't hang out, and they're not yeah. in the prison yeah. together. Yeah. Millie is asking why, why, um, uh, why they had a joint trial, but I think that's because th that was just the way things were. I think they still are done, right? If you're, um, if, if you're accused of the same crime or participating in the same crime. So, you know, that's a, that's a good question that I know. I don't think anybody has really answered satisfactorily. So I think that they were uh, paired together because they were to get, they were actually together at the same time when they were arrested. They were on a tram about to distribute leaflets. Um, so that's part of their po political activity. And they were caught up in this dragnet and they were just interrogated at the same time and then and kind of taken out together. And so they were just considered to be in cahoots with each other. Hmm. Um, but it's not, it's not, you know, that for me is one of the, is one of the flaws of the trial in which I, I don't find a convincing explanation for why, you know, they were sort of just seen as attached to each other at the hip from the beginning. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, no, I, I, I and I, I, I'm not sure about in terms of the, um, uh, the legal process when the state decides to prosecute uh, people for the same crime individually or together. Um, but I think they, they clearly saw an advantage of, um, of prosecuting them together for the same crime. And, and it was a convenient way of, of linking them to, um, e even though it was a, a, 
a, a non-political crime, but to the political context of who they were, right? Right, right. Um, so I, I just want to uh, shift tax for a second um, and talk about the, the context in which you wrote the book, because I think the students would be really interested in this, which... Um, was you know from what I understand it the, the peak of I, I want to say the peak of the war of terror on the war, of the war on terror although of course the war on terror goes on although perhaps it has plateaued um, and but you were thinking about about the uh, the United States role in the world and its relationship uh, to Europe and the rest of the world um, at the time and um, I was wondering if you could say you know why. What was it that was interesting about this case that attracted to you, uh, that attracted you to this case and this topic um, at a time that the United States was not very popular and going it alone and um, and and navigating its relationship with the rest of the world in a particular way? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. So, uh, taking the, trying to take a stroll down memory lane here, you know, uh, it's not like you're sort of me as a young sort of a young person trying to look for a good topic to write about it's not that like i'm saying oh well here's what's going on in the world let me find something in history that you know connects to that i think the way it works is we all live in the present moment and the present moment it impacts how we think about everything it, and, and it impacts how we think about the past we're always looking at the past through the through this kind of lens of where we are now uh, even the most, you know, experienced historians do that one way or another. So the moment that I was kind of fishing around for this, for, for a topic to write about, uh, was that moment that you just described in which uh, post 9-11, the United States plunges itself into this so-called war on terror, uh, which is not just a war on terror, it has a whole kind of geopolitical consequence for the relationship between the United States and the rest of the world, especially the Middle East, but also um, countries in Europe and Latin America, Asia and other parts of the world, but also in particular how it impacted people in America, right? What the Patriot Act does, right? What the increased, right, sort of militarization of American society in various ways, both economic, social, cultural, et cetera, Right, the fact that I would go, I went into the, I was at Columbia University, and I go into the faculty house, and they changed the name of French fries to Freedom Fries, because they did that at Columbia. Oh yeah, oh, oh. sure, because and it's not Columbia University. It's, it's the it's the restaurant at the faculty house, but still, they <laughs> you know that's still like a little anecdote. But those, but I had I had friends and colleagues, especially Muslims, who were harassed and, and, and interrogated, and some of them had to leave the country. And, and this, so this was not to mention all the, you know, death and destruction ab ab abroad that, uh, that we wrought as a, as a result of the death and destruction that was, you know, that happened in the United States, right? So, so that uh, is, is inevitably going to shape how I'm going to examine things in the past. Um, and I, uh, first of all, I was drawn to the Sacco Vanzetti case because I thought it was a really incredible story, uh, just as a story, right? So, like, think about it as, you know, what, what do you want to read as a novel or what do you want to watch as a movie? You're going to want to watch or uh, read a novel or watch a movie that has a great story, right? But that's not enough. You sort of have to dig a little bit deeper and explain why things happened the way they did, right? And so I found that that was a very early and powerful case in which something that happened in the United States, in fact, locally in Boston, has such an enormous global impact, in, in, a, in a sense, an adverse one, because it really causes problems for American kind of interaction with the world. But then, in particular, I was interested in how, in American society, that plays out. The fact that the United States is engaged in the, with the world in this sort of way, right, has all kinds of pretty insane effects inside American society. They often go understudied because people underestimate the extent to which Americans are actually reactive to things that happen abroad, uh, uh, or, and especially the way that the things that happen with the United States abroad, okay? 
Um, and so I, I was drawn to the topic. I thought it was a perfect way both to write an interesting history, but also try to understand the moment that we were, we are still really going through. Yeah, and and I mean, you you talked about um, the the sort of dramatic change um, that in in how uh, the trial was treated in the rest of the world, right? Um, and that's a key you know a uh, key theme of your of your book and and a key theme of uh, one of the chapters the students had to read. But you know, what do you think changed in the world? Um, between let's say 1920, 1921, and 1926, 1927, um, to launch this trial uh, from from a case, right? Just a sort of criminal case in a not particularly central location, not involving particularly important people, to the affair that it was, right? Something had to change in the world during that um, during that time and in the United States. So what do you think it was that the key issue that changed that to launch this from case to affair? I think there is a lot of, so that's a hard question to answer because I think the list is long. So it's only six years, but if you look at history in a micro sort of way, six years is a long time. Like think about, okay, what are we now in 2020? Think about what the world looked like in 2014. <laughs> so if you went back in time and told people in 2014, hey, all, all this stuff is happening in 2020, it's going to be, you know, people will be completely, you know, just mind boggled, right? So it's not, it's not at all, it's a six years ago, right? So you, what you, most of you were very, you know, you were children, right? They so were in middle school. And I, and I was, I was also a child and, I'm, and I wasn't, but I was younger, Okay. <laughs> And so we had six, you six years hair, is a long gray time. Hair, gray, less gray hairs. Yes, no, I was much, yeah, I was much, much, much younger. So it was, it was different. But 1921 to 1927, one of the things I think that you can say changes is by 1927, it's very clear that uh, what the role of the United States in the world is going to be. And so on, so on the one hand, this um, military and cultural uh, power that has enormous influence, especially in Europe, Latin America, right, uh, Asia, uh, uh, also East Asia, uh, but at the same time, it's an increasingly isolationist place. Suppose is, isolationist is not actually a very good word, okay, but I'm using it as a kind of placeholder, okay, uh, but what I mean by that is just this refusal to accept international opinion as something to factor in. Okay, so those two things are in collision. And I think that there's a powerful response in the world to that. Say, hey, wait, wait a minute, you guys are like the leaders of the world, but you actually don't, you don't at all care what, what the world thinks, right? And you have no, you're not showing any awareness that there's a world outside the United States that, that matters, right, internally. So I think that's one thing that changes. And 1927 is already after the passage of the National Origins Act. So there was immigration restriction by then. Um, and then finally, just in terms of what happens with the case, I think is very important. So in 1920s, what happens in 1927 is that the legal process has played out and now there's an execution that's imminent. And I think that that's, makes it a very urgent thing. So until then there was, it's like a trial, but there's appeals and there's like a hope that it's going to, you know, end differently. And um, by 1927, when it kind of, it's the end of the road, then it becomes urgent. And I think that that sort of immediacy is what the, is what kind of sparks that crazy summer of 1927, which is when really, you know, that's when it hits its peak. But presumably, I mean, other other people were executed, right? I don't know what how many people the uh, U.S. was executing, but you know, uh, other people would be executed without um, without drawing in Mussolini and Stalin and the Pope uh, to to make their various pleas, right? So this was something something that really um, really remanate, uh, re resonated here. Well, that's why I got intrigued. I wanted to know. Yeah. Just what you said. So these are, it's two guys, right? And yeah. there were other executions. There were many injustices, not just in the United States, many parts of the world. Yeah. Um, and the anti rad you know, there's something about Sacco and Vanzetti themselves 
And something about the locale of the case, generally speaking in the United States at that time, given what was happening in the world, and then specifically Massachusetts, and even more specifically Boston, uh, that, that combination is very combustible for some reason, right? That for some reason is what I wanted to explore. So let's let's talk about that, though. So, I mean, what was it uh, in particular uh, about Boston um, that made it uh, combustible? I mean, we talked about um, uh, we talked about last week about uh, Massachusetts' role, really, um, in paving the way to what would eventually be federal immigration restrictions with its own state laws attempting to restrict um, Irish migration. Um, and, um, you know, Professor Hirota, uh, he, he, he really emphasized to me, you know, separately in conversations, you know, to, to talk to the students about how much continuity there really was and how much this, this um, uh, how much this continues and if anything intensifies, right? This, there's this whole um, uh, anti-immigration league that's founded in Boston and, and the records are actually digitized um, uh, by Harvard. And he gave me a, a document, which I, I put online for the students to read today because it was later chronologically um, than, than what we were talking about last week it was from 1897, um, you know, with a lot of continuity by this immigration Restriction League, and by this point, it's it really is very much aimed at at Italians uh, in Boston, yeah. um, and you know, and and anti-Catholicism, obviously, uh, being a continuity as well, um, and and as you pointed out, you know, in in the midst between uh, their arrest and their execution, the U.S. passed it's it's a, a federal immigration uh, restriction. Um, so, but that's that's at the federal level. But you know, just to sort of go back to this issue of of Boston and and um, and Massachusetts, you know, is this a trial that that would have happened this way and gained this particular uh, acclaim elsewhere? Was there something uh, particular about Boston uh, and its political conservatism, its anti-Catholicism? Um, that um, set the stage. Uh, that set the stage for this, and or even its stubbornness. You talk about its stubbornness. How how it becomes sort of a Boston against the world sort of sort of situation. Um, you know what? Maybe we could you could just say a few more words about about Boston in particular um, right. and the context. So uh, the caveat is I'm not I'm not a historian of <clears throat> Boston. And so a lot of what I learned about Boston, insofar as I know anything about Boston, was actually through this, this case. Uh, and I learned a lot about, at the time, about Boston, Massachusetts, social history, political history, economic history. And I think, and you're right, I think th that the case, the way that played out is inexplicable without the Boston connection, right? So <clears throat> part of it is the transformation in the state. So the Anti-Immigration League, it's not just digitized at Harvard. It happened at Harvard. That's the president point. of Harvard, yeah. A. Lawrence Lowell, is from the Lowell family, right, one of the biggest and richest and most important families in Massachusetts, was the honorary president of the Anti-Immigration uh, League. He called himself the Immigration Restriction League. Okay. Um, so it's, it's a big part of not just Boston life, Boston elite life. Um, and uh, Boston at the time, right? It's hard to understand today because it's a very different place in some ways. Not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't over, I wouldn't overstate that because Me neither. <laughs> there's, a, there's a way in which there's continuities and let's maybe not get into that now, but the, the Boston of 19, the 1920s is very different from 2020. Okay. Uh, and Massachusetts general, it's actually a very conservative state. Uh, the whole region, New England, is very conservative. In fact, we were talking last night when we had our chat. Um, if you look at an electoral map from the 1920s or 1930s, especially the 1930s, or, so Franklin Roosevelt, very popular Democratic president, wins re-election in 1936 in a landslide. 
the biggest landslide in American presidential history. And he wins all but two states. And those two states are Vermont and Maine. Okay, so he wins Massachusetts, but just barely. And, and the rest of the country is just a cakewalk. So I have to understand New England and Massachusetts and Boston were very conservative at the time. And by conservative, it's also not the conservative of today. So it has to do with, yes, a, 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 a sort of the, eth the ethnicity question, the religion question, right? And um, if there's any group of people that is le less liked by the Boston wasps than the Irish, it's the Italians, okay? And they're m most definitively not on the right side of the color line. All right, it takes time for, just like it takes time for the Irish to become white and the J Jewish people to become white, um, it takes time for the Italians to become white. And Sacco and Vanzetti don't benefit from that protection, okay? So the fact that they're Italian is extremely important in terms of the prejudice that they are suffering from, um, in term, you know, and, and just even in terms of the, the, their place in relation to the rest of Boston society. Then in terms of how people see Boston. So that's interesting, you know, Boston, Massachusetts in the 19th century is actually considered the, 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 you know, the jewel in the crown of American life. If you think about the, who are the biggest authors of the 19th century in the United States? You know, this is a Hawthorne, right? Thoreau, um, Longfellow, Emerson, all four of them from Massachusetts. Massachusetts is considered to be an intellectual powerhouse. In the Atlantic uh, also, the Atlantic uh, the Republic. Yeah, and, and so that Boston is considered to be the intellectual center of American life. By, by the time we're in the 1920s, that's all gone. I mean, there's still remnants of it, but they've been overtaken and they're seen as much more of a provincial backwater, very reactionary, right? Um, and so there's a sense of, you know, a, a sense of decline, a sense of a, pl a place that's very bigoted, um, that hates foreigners, that hates people who are different, uh, very intolerant. The books are banned in Boston. That's a reputation, right? Um, so that's also part of the reason why people look at Boston very unfavorably. And then finally, I'd say there's symbolism to Boston, right? Boston is the, is the you know, the, the home of the American Revolution. It's where all these ideas of liberty and, I mean, there's also Philadelphia, but, you know, Boston is where th the whole ethos of American values of freedom and liberty and tolerance, et cetera, et cetera, are shaped and formed. And so when the Sacco Vanzetti thing happens, it's not, oh, there's this thing happening in like, I don't know, Wichita, Kansas. No, no, no. It's happening where people formulated these ideas of enlightenment that are supposed to be an inspiration to the world and were an inspiration to the world. And the Sacco Vanzetti case is the complete antithesis of that. So the way I see it, it was, it just, you know, it made it more compelling and disturbing that this was happening in, in Boston, right? It put, it put a light on it that maybe wouldn't have happened anywhere else. Yeah, and and there's a great tie in there when you're talking about that the, the you know that the anti-immigration league um, wasn't wasn't just you know it, that that it was this was based at Harvard, right? This was another thing that Professor Hirota was, was saying. You know, like in the 1850s, the the, the know nothing position, the nativist position, the anti-immigration position was the absolute common sense position in 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 Massachusetts. It it was, you know, accepted at every level um, across the board, mm -hmm. um, and but at the same time, that this co coexisted with abolitionism, right? Um, so people could have at the same time, and, and did have at the same time, um, you know, views that would were were individuals harboring uh, escaped slaves. Uh, and advocating for um, the deportation of the Irish uh, at the same time. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting with the Sacco and Vanzetti case as well, because, you know, even though at Harvard, among the liberal elite, among the Brahmins, um, uh, there there is this, you know, uh, they didn't look favorably on uh, upon the Italians, upon immigrants, upon anarchists, right? 
but Sacco and Vanzetti build up this, this um, large uh, coterie of, of elite supporters, right? Um, who take over his, uh, who take over their, their um, defense, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So how do these things go together? I mean, we know why, we know why radicals would support Sacco and Vanzetti, right? Um, but wh- why would these liberal, uh, the sort of liberal Brahmin elite, uh, many of whom were, you know, small C conservative um, and hold all of these, you know, these problematic views towards immigrants, many of them take on the case uh, as a sort of cause celeb. Well, I mean, many elites, I mean, this is true today as it was then, many, many elites are, you know, socially progressive, uh, culturally progressive, uh, while also very, very um, jealous of their class interests, okay? Mm-hmm. So that, that those two things go together. We know that, uh, we see it all the time. Um, it's no different then, uh, but it's true, as you point out, that there is a split among the elite, uh, and there are many people in the elite who do support Sacco and Vanzetti, not just support them, devote their, you know, work to them. And even in some cases, their lives, right? The, the kind of commitment that we see uh, in the defense committee um, from the legal team, but also a lot of the supporters, Brahmin supporters, and then elites around the world who kind of gather in support of them is quite, is quite impressive, Right? Even Vanzetti and Sacco, are imp- Sacco and Vanzetti are impressed, right? It's not, it's, it's very significant. I think part of it is, I think a sense of embarrassment. Like you, you're looking, so these are people who are very committed to the system. They're not revolutionaries. They're not radicals. They're, you know, they're elites. And they, they say, wait a minute, we, this is not supposed to happen. This case is a, is a travesty. Uh, and it makes the system look bad. I'm not saying they're being cynical about it and they don't care about Sacco and Manzini. I think they do. I think a lot of this is saying, this is a really, really uh, embarrassing thing that happened. And we have to rescue not just Sacco and Manzini, but we have to rescue the reputation of our legal system. We have to rescue the reputation of Boston, Massachusetts, and the United States. Okay. So I think that's a very powerful factor in why they get so involved. It's, it's almost like a counter, not just to the, you know, these, these bigoted reactionary people like the judge and, you know, these others who are, don't even hide their, you know, how much they're, you know, unabashedly hostile to Sacco and Manzetti, right? But, but it's also a counter to this very uh, powerful argument made by these r- radicals, right, who are saying Sacco and Vanzetti are victims of the system. They're victims of the class structure in the United States. They're victims of capitalism. They're victims of American power uh, and racism. And, and, that, and those things have seeped into the institutions, not just seep, they are at the heart of the institutions. So they understand these radicals, anarchists, communists, socialists, and others are looking at the case as a product of a whole structure, right? And a lot of these elites who are in the, their camp are saying, no, 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 you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. You, 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 we, we have a good system. It just malfunctioned. And, yeah. and we, have to, we, have to, we have to restore it to, to, to where it was. And so I think a lot of this commitment to Sacco and Manzetti, I don't mean to, dis- I think it's very, you know, very important. And rereading my stuff last night, I was like, who is this guy who wrote this book? I don't agree with anything he said. Like, <laughs> it's a weird out of body experience where I was like yeah. reading it and saying, this Temkin guy. I've done that before. He doesn't yeah. know what he's talking about. <laughs> Nonsense. No, I, it wasn't that far, but it was like, you know, you rethink things. So I think back then I was much more uh, wrapped up in the, you know, and a lot of these sources that I was finding that 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 showed the importance of kind of elite support for their cause. But I also, going looking back, I would emphasize also their own class interest in protecting the kind of the system from the reputation loss of a case like this. I think that that came through to to defend younger Moshe Temkin. I think that 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 very much came through because. You know, you talk about, which I, I love, the big difference 
between um, the radical supporters and the elite supporters. So the radical supporters never expected to win. You know, they, of course, of course, Shitsako and Vanzetti are going to lose. They're not, we're not going to win this. You know, that's, this is a, a political oppression. It's class oppression. It's the, an unjust system. It, they, it would be almost, you know, against what they believed in to actually win, whereas right. that, whereas the elite were shocked. You know, of course they the system should operate fairly, and and that they become invested in the case specifically to you know to 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 prove to themselves that the the system actually does um, uh, does function, and were surprised when they lost. So I I think that actually that came through really yeah, well. Yeah, and, and the other thing I would say is that just to add to that um, the the that they not just expect the system to work, but they expect to be listened to. Yeah. Like they expect to carry the day. And it's like, uh -huh. it's, it's like, okay, you know, you've played your little, you know, you've made your mistakes and now listen to the adults in the room when we're telling you that you're, you know, you're a bunch of idiots and you made a mistake. Okay. But in all, and look, to be, to be frank, there's also an element, you know, I was rereading the, that chapter two and I, I was thinking, hmm, it's interesting. I, I didn't, I didn't remember that there was kind of a populist component to the, to the, uh, to the sort of not support of Sacco Nanzetti, but support of the of the trial, right? Of the, of of reaction to these elites who are coming in, in support of Sacco Nanzetti. So a lot of the flavor of all these people who are like gung ho about going forth with the execution. They're actually not necessarily members of the elites that are doing that, but they're all like sort of these, you know, these lower, lower ranked people that are uh, very resentful. They're saying, who are these eggheads from New York? Screw the libs. These, these, uh, these Parisians, you know, with their, you know, with their wine and their snobbery who are telling us what to do, right? These globalists these internationalists, we, you know, we're, we're Americans and we know what's best for us. And, and there's also a resent, resentment of, you know, elites from cities and universities. Um, and there's so, so there's another component to this case, which is interesting of how a lot of the hostility to Sacco and Manzetti ironically then comes from people who are not from the elite, uh, but they feel that that the case, the defense of these two men has become like this, this condescending elite cause, right? So, um, and that's another way I think in which the dynamics of kind of Bo Boston at the time play out. Yeah, and you, I mean, you make the sort of, you push the envelope and you make the argument um, and, you know, supported by things that that the, the governor, at, that Fuller said um, uh, afterwards about his reasoning, but that for for not granting clemency, but um, but that that they were executed, you know, not not despite um, despite the international uproar, but arguably because of the international uproar, which is really interesting and actually allows me to bring in this is I have other questions, of course, especially relating to chapter five, which I strongly recommended the students read on on. The, the sort of later life of the trial. Um, but there's there's a lot of questions in the chat um, uh, about the context of what the way the trial was held and and um, and the execution. So um, uh, I want to bring them in so that we have time. Um, maybe I'll ask a few of these now if you don't mind and you can order them uh, answer them in any order. But um, Alexander was was asking about uh, the connection um, with the trial. You know, if it was seen, this I guess ties into what I was talking about in terms of the later life about if it was seen uh, in the context of McCarthyism. If if that was sort of projected backwards as seeing being seen as a um, uh, a prelude. Um, Gory's question about whether you actually think they committed the crime, maybe we'll hold on to that for the end. Wait, 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 let me, let me, add, let me, so I'll get, I will get, because that's usually, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Usually that's like the, the first, first question. question. <laughs> the first question is always, did they do it? Yeah. Like, don't, don't tell all this highfalutin history stuff. Did they do it? Like, that's what people want. So that's the second question. The first question about McCarthy, I don't know how much people know about McCarthy, so I do 
think that if you read chapter five, you will learn about those connections because the way that the, tr the trial has, the case has like an afterlife. It starts in the 1950s and continues into the 60s in a very strange, I didn't expect to write about it, but all these sources were pointing me in that direction. So I, I wrote about it. And the reason it comes back is because of the debate over McCarthyism. And so um, there is an attempt among American writers, thinkers, pundits, historians, and so on, to try to understand how McCarthyism happened. And they look back and they say, well, you have to understand the Sacco Vanzetti affair. You have to understand how that played out to see the dynamics, because there is this thinking that um, the people who were the biggest opponents of McCarthyism were also the biggest supporters of Sacco and Vanzetti. And there were actually some people who were supporting Sacco Vanzetti, like John Dos Passos who, and Max Eastman. There, there's a phenomenon in, in American life back then of people who moved from left to right, from extreme left to extreme right, John Dos Passos and Max Eastman being the no notable ones. This is, um, is neoconservatives, and that's what define neoconservatives. Neoconservatives, but these are like this. I'm talking about like you know writing for like William F. Buck writing for the National Review and stuff like that. So these are these. This is a way in which a lot of the people who were defending McCarthyism said, "Well, you have to understand these people are like, you know, they are products of the Sacco, Sacco Vanzetti affair." So yes, it's seen as a as a prelude, and a lot of the division is similar, um, including the dynamic of a kind of singling out radicals and trying to expunge them and punish them, um, you know, kill them in case of, in the case of Sacco Manzetti were executed and the Rosenbergs were executed um, in, in 1952 in the, in the United States. So there are parallels to be made, to be made there. So uh, yeah, I would, I think chapter five, I go into more detail. I think it's pretty interesting how that, how that plays out. Um, in terms of where I think they did it or not, well, I'll put it, let me put it this way. <clears throat> um, I explicitly say in the book that I do not want to answer the question. Okay, <laughs> so shame on all of, no, I'm kidding. It's a, it's a good question. So um, if you told me that Sacco and Vanzetti bombed a building, or if you told me they went and assassinated some captain of industry, okay, then I'd believe it. I'd say that that actually, I wouldn't put it past them. I don't think, I mean, a lot of these liberal defenders said, no, these guys are saintly and dreamy and gentle and they're poets and philosophers. And yeah, maybe, but that doesn't, that doesn't preclude violence. Okay? And I, I, I think they, it's not that they were violent personally necessarily, but I do believe, I think they clearly believed that violence or violent, violence was a necessary component of the actions that needed to be taken to bring about a just society, okay? But this particular crime, which is a crime of a, a, a stealing a case of money, which it was never recovered by the way, okay? From a paymaster and his guard, and then jumping in a getaway car with two other guys and fleeing the scene doesn't compute for me. So I'm not, I'm not omnipresent. Like I'm, I don't have, I'm not a mind reader. I can't, wasn't there. I don't know, you know, nobody, I, the truth is that nobody really knows. So I'm not going to say one way or the other because that's presumptuous. Although the what fact I'm saying is that it's, it's not for me, for me, the crime and the person, the, the, what we know about these two people Okay, for better or worse, not just for better, but also for worse, it doesn't, they don't connect. So I've never been able to really reconcile those two things. Unless, unless the money, because it was never recovered, went to their anarchist activities in Mexico or wherever else or Italy, but. Except that, that, that again, the, these are, this is a crime um, that wasn't an exceptional crime. And not only that, let's not forget, somebody confessed to the crime. Right, yeah. Another person, Celestino Maderos, who was a professional criminal. Who was executed, executed at the same time, right? Executed I mean, at the same time. And he, among other things, told the authorities, I don't know these two guys and they have nothing to do with what, what, you know, what we did. But he was disbelieved. I'm not sure he was wise. He was disbelieved. 
So what about um, the it's a prof- it, was a prof- it was a professional job. You know, banditry is a kind of a profession. You got to know how to do it to get away, like to run away. It's not like, like if you told me, okay, now you're going to, in 10 <laughs> minutes, you're going to go rob, a, rob somebody, steal the money, kill them, and then get, jump in a getaway car. I'd say, wait, I'm not ready. I don't know how to do that. How Somebody do you, has to, like, you have to get professionalized to do that. You got to be in a, in a gang. You have to learn the ropes. How I do don't know how to do that. And Sacco and Vanzetti, neither of them had criminal record or any record that they had been participating in any uh, crime of this sort. Um, and the other part is, if they did do it, they were like the world's greatest actors. Because if you look at the statements that, you know, the way that they're for six years pleading their innocence and you know, kind of talking very clear, also, you know, providing um, this sort of very clear uh, self-presentation that convinced so many people that they didn't do it, including conservatives, including all kinds of very skeptical people who don't like anarchists, then this must have been like, they, they must have been like uh, the, the, you know, actors, the likes of which even, you know, the Shakespearean world has never known. So all, all this to say is that I'm skeptical. How do you think, skeptical. How do you think Professor Temkin uh, can afford his villa in France? You know, he knows uh, when he when he talks about banditry, he knows, he knows, he's yeah, exactly. from experience. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, well, I'm just going to... More like a hovel, but yes. No, it's a VLI. I'm sure it's a VLI. I'm, big, I'm picturing. <laughs> I'm picturing a chateau. Obviously, that's that's where bandits escape to with right, their right. Uh, with their ill-gotten gains. Um, so I'm going to consolidate a few of these questions from the students about um, uh, um, about the context of the execution and the trial, since they're all related. Um, Anna was asking about. Um, Stalin, how Stalin used the trial to shape the public opinion of his regime in the Soviet Union, which I, I think is was a really interesting part of the book, both Mussolini and um, Stalin's reactions. And and I mean, it's not what Anna's asking about, but um, but Mussolini especially, how his sort of views on this on on the trial changed, I thought were really um, fascinating, and and the position that it put him in as a fascist leader um, was uncomfortable, which was really uh, interesting, especially when the US wouldn't listen to him. Um, and then Gory is asking about, oh no, I just spilled water on myself, but that's okay. Um, Gory was asking about um, uh, the context of the Red Scare and Liam is asking about um, a connection uh, to, or, um, similarity and differences to the Joe Hill trial. So I thought I would um, uh, consolidate those those questions together. All right, how are you? Okay, now consolidate them. I'm, so, I, so I'm hearing I'm hearing three questions <laughs> and now I want you to consolidate. Are you calling, them. calling me on my BS? Um, so, so one is, uh, um, one is the, so the, the Stalin question and the, um, the Red Scare question are related. So, um, or I can make a, I can make a connection there. Right. So, so one is about how, how Stalin used the trial, um, with his, his own regime and whether that actually, you know, gave any credence to, uh, the Red Scare reaction here. I guess that's my connection. Um, and the the last one, I suppose, is, is on its own, though. The the Joe, Joe Hill. So uh, for those who don't know, that Joe Hill was a uh, late, early, very early 20th century uh, labor activist and socialist, originally from Sweden. His real name was Joseph Hillstrom, um, who became involved with the Wobblies, and he was. Uh, he, he was also had a case in which he was put on put on trial and, and executed uh, for a crime he claimed he never never committed, um, and it's seen as one of a of, of a number of cases that preceded the Sacco Vanzetti case in terms of kind of railroading radicals uh, and accusing them of crimes in order to destroy them, get rid of them. Right. Um, one difference is I think. The, the Sakovan City case is unique, even just because of its sheer volume and scope. So um, I cannot think of another um, sort of 
United States event or political issue that gets such a uh, massive global reaction until you have to go all the way up to the Vietnam War to get that kind of reaction, to see those kinds of like demonstrations, riots, petitions, um, you know, uh, governments that are protesting, uh, that it creates a diplomatic crisis for the United States. That's the level that the Sacco Vanzetti affair got to. That was unprecedented. No other case that I know of in the United States reached that level of disturbance, geopolitical disturbance. It's one thing for like, you know, uh, activists to get upset and, you know, demonstrate. Um, in, in, and it's, but it's another thing for entire um, foreign, you know, cities and societies uh, to have these gigantic uh, mass demonstrations, protests, and sometimes riots in the streets because of a case that happened internally in the United States. I thought that was amazing. I mean, and if you put the, just a list of places where that happened, everywhere from like Casablanca, Morocco, to Copenhagen, Denmark, <clears throat> to uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, to London, England, and then var you know, various places elsewhere, uh, it was truly global, okay? Um, now, part of it, of course, is that's the explanation for how Stalin, like people like Stalin, Mussolini get involved. Now, why do they get involved? It's not like Stalin, you know, if you, if you know the history of Stalin, Stalin is not the kind of guy who's going to lose sleep at night because two people are being executed somewhere. He's just not that kind of guy. Some of us are those kinds of, like some of us, when you hear some people are being executed somewhere in the world and you think it's unjust, that is, will keep you up at night. It will because it's it's disturbing, right? You feel a sense of justice that is stirring, and it it impacts you. It might even move you to act, right? Stalin is not that kind of guy. Okay, Stalin killed millions of people. So why is he getting involved with the Sacco Vanzetti affair? It's because for the same reason that Mussolini gets involved, because it's so it becomes so symbolically important, so politically important. That you, it's a sort of event that you can't just, you, you can't afford to let it pass by you. You have to, if you're a public intellectual of some sort, like let's say you're a columnist in a newspaper, in a newspaper, um, or you're, you know, you're <clears throat> people are waiting to hear your voice on a certain issue. You will talk about it because people expect to hear what you have to say about it because it's important. It's important to people. And for Stalin, it's a situation where he sees that this is what is galvanizing people around the world, especially the left. And because Stalin is engaged in a project of trying to gain control of the worldwide left, and because he's also engaged in a project of geopolitical uh, uh, power, and he's engaged in a project of internal consolidation of power, he's going to try to make hay of the Sacco Vanzetti affair. And the way to do that is what is something that he does very well, which is propaganda. Okay, so he does all kinds of things, like stay. He ordered streets in the Soviet Union named after Sacco Vanzetti. That's why you have streets in various places in the former Soviet Union named after Sacco Vanzetti. The construction of the biggest uh, pencil factory uh, in the Soviet Union that produced pencils for children all over the Soviet Union for decades thereafter were, uh, was the Sacco Vanzetti pencil factory, which produced pencils and crayons. So I can tell you a little anecdote about that. I was once invited, I was once in, uh, in uh, <clears throat> Vilnius, Lithuania. Don't ask why, but I was there in the dead of winter. It was like there, so super cold. And I was giving, and I was invited to give a lecture on the Soviet dimension of the Sacco Vanzetti affair. And I get up there and I start lecturing on the Soviet dimension of the cycle, just what I've been talking about now. And I start, I see that people are giving me these funny looks. It's very funny looks. I thought maybe there's something and something uh, the way I'm talking. Or, and it, it, it was explained to me that people attended this talk because they thought I was going to be talking about the history of pencil production in the Soviet Union. <laughs> A topic about which I know 
very little. And I, mean, I don't know that much it. about pencil production, generally speaking. And then in the Soviet Union, I know like even less. So there was that's what for very you know people much much later, right? That's what what it means. So anyway, that anecdote is just to explain why you know how you kind of take a case that's happening very far away and try to use it for your own political benefit. Uh, and Mussolini had to do the same thing because he's trying to consolidate his own power. He's a relatively new dictator, right? And he's been in power for you know just a few years. And now he's got this case in which two Italians are on trial, you know, being executed in the United States and there's nationalist sentiment in his country. So he has to find a way to um, handle that situation and try at least that it doesn't hurt his own interests. Okay, so that's, I think, part of, I mean, there's other reasons why Mussolini gets involved, but I think that that is why um, you have to understand a case like this, when it gets, when it explodes worldwide, it will kind of like uh, seep into different domains, sometimes very surprising ones. And, you know, the, so there's also the, a question about uh, the context of the Red Scare. And I, and I think that that's a, a major part of it, that what you're saying that, um, but it's only one part. Is there anything, um, anything you would, uh, you would elaborate on the, um, uh, the I, I guess the, the, the significance of the fact that uh, communism Right, this ideology all of a sudden had geographically consolidated a political entity, and in, and in fact, the trial begins right, really with at the exact moment of the 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 victory of the Red Army in the Civil War, right? When they're, so they're... that's right. So you have um, the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, and let's not forget that it happens toward the end of World War One. Okay, so uh, all of a sudden after that, suddenly you have a it's the first time that a Marxist political power was a uh, political party was able to take power uh, in a huge territory, right? With a, with a major army. Not only that, they're telling you then that their goal is world, you know, uh, world influence. Um, and already the United States, Americans, like ever since then, it's part of American history is to be um, ideologically, opposed to communism and fearful of communism and to suspect that communists are in the United States trying to subvert America. So that is already going on back then. And as you point out, that their um, arrest and trial coincides with that moment of fear coming after the, um, after the First World War and after the Bolshevik Revolution with a strong sense among many Americans that there's like these subversives within that are trying to take down American society. And so it's not just communism. People, I mean, communists and anarchists actually hate each other. Like if you actually talk to live, like talk to, you know, talk to <clears throat> a communist friend, an anarchist friend, ask them what they think of each other. They hate each other. I mean, anarchists think that communism is oppressive. They hate the Soviet Union. They hate centralized and hierarchical power, which is what communism really, uh, and, or part of what that it is. Especially at this moment, because at this moment, you know, in the the Russian civil war, especially in in Ukraine, um, the uh, the Red Army right. used the anarchists to to help defeat uh, the White Army, and then turned on them. So they, put them, they threw them all in prison or killed them. Yeah, and in fact, Stalin was doing all this uh, naming streets after Sako Vanzetti and giving speeches about Sako Vanzetti at the same time that he was putting an all the Soviet anarchists in prison, the comrades of Sako Vanzetti. Right, so we have to think about that as well. Um, so it's a big feature of American life. I don't know how many, you know, how much background everybody here has in studying these things, but a big part of uh, 20th century U.S. history, starting from that period all the way through the 20th century and even to the present. I'd um, say we're still, it's still the same. Oh, it's it's coming, and they're talking about a new Cold War, right? And if you look at, I mean, let's get get into much into that, but the a big part of the relationship or the lack of relationship with China has to do with that lingering uh, ideological component, for sure. Um, so Sako and Manzetti, even though they're not communists, are connected to that because people tend to lump all these radicals together. 
Okay, so it's it's part of the context in which this happens. So there's a question from Toby, um, and I don't know, uh, I, I don't know how, um, how 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 you want to approach this exactly, but he's he's just interested in um, in the circumstances um, of, of how the concept of whiteness extended to um, to uh, Irish Jews, Italians, etc. How that process. Um, worked. If that is, uh, and maybe you have a good answer for it, better better than I would. Um, but I, I would just add on to that um, a slightly different variation, which is that you know I, I thought one of the one of the things that I loved reading was um, uh, the their final statements. The you know what the it, in the in court and Sacco says. I don't want to get this wrong, but something like um, uh, I am, I am being persecuted. I was persecuted as an Italian, and I am being persecuted as a, or I am an Italian, a radical, uh, and I'm being persecuted as a radical. And I was an Italian, and yeah, I was persecuted yeah. as an Italian, suggesting that that the that at first it was about being Italian and now it's about being radical unless I'm misreading so it. Sacco makes a state these are the famous statements in court that they make yeah. right at the sentencing um to for execution. And Sacco says um he talks about being oppressed because of class. He says, you know, I'm I'm part of the working class and this is this is the way one way in which the working class is being punished. Um, Vanzetti talks more about um, I am being punished uh, because I was an Italian, and indeed I am an Italian. And I'm being oh, punished because I'm a radical, idea. and indeed I am a ra indeed I am a radical. Mm -hmm. um, so, for sure, the Italian, as I mentioned before, the Italian component is very important because it's they're not. It's very early in the process, which is a very amorphous, vague, and problematic process of you know becoming white. Now, do I have a good answer to how they became white? I do not, because uh, I don't think anybody really does. I, because these things are not these things are not empirical. You see, like they're it's not like Italians or Irish or Jewish people like ch change. It, it's just the our our ideas about race and ethnicity change. Okay, so they didn't actually become anything. Okay, what people did do is they became Americanized. So I think if you look at the generation of Italian immigrants, Jewish immigrants, Irish immigrants, and other like East Asian immigrants, like, so Mexican immigrants, um, within one or two or three generations, you get a very different kind of um, social and sociological um, sense of place and context, right? So part of what happens is 30 years 40 years after the execution of Sacco and Manzetti, Italian Americans are in a very different position from where they were at the time of the execution, so that it becomes almost um, inexplicable to a lot of people how that happened. I mean, by 19, the 1950s and 1960s, you have elected officials in Massachusetts who are Italian, Amer Italian American. Um, we have people today who are <clears throat> very much, you know, on the side of immigration restriction, who work for the Trump administration, who are Jewish American, Irish American, Italian American. They've gotten, so I'm a historian. Sometimes when I hear these people's names, okay, I take it, like I'm, it takes me aback. I, I'm not, like how the guy who was in charge of enforcing immigration policy in terms of the, it was the, uh, I can't remember. I can't remember exactly what his job was. They can. Uh, I don't want to massacre his name, but it was an Italian American, Ken uh, uh, Corcinelli or something like that. But it was like what this is like. I worked on Sacco and Manzetti. I know what the reaction was to Italian immigration, and so we have a process now where that changes over time. So it's not just about whiteness. I think it's also about um, belong. You know, belonging. To this Amer to this so-called American collective, right, and that's a process that happens over time, and it's a and it's, and it's a it's a very complex one.
I think that uh, that's actually a great way of putting it much, much better than I could have that as it being a part of Americanization. And I, and I would say, and, and, you know, just like Professor Temkin was saying, it, it comes through a process of, of Italians themselves, you know, presenting themselves as Americanized, even, even in taking on uh, positions that could be restrictive, you know, uh, for restrictive immigration or any host of political issues. Um, you know, if, if you're interested on, on, there's a book about this on the Jewish side of things by Eric Goldstein called The Price of Whiteness, um, which is about, about, you know, he says about how Jews became white in America. And, and, and it's exactly like Professor Temkin is talking about um, a lot of uh, Jews sort of advocating for their own Americanness, uh, which they see as, as being white and Judaism being a religion, um, Protestantizing Judaism just the way Catholicism to a certain extent becomes Protestantized in certain ways in the United States, um, and, and also making distinctions between them and Blacks. Um, and I think that for, uh, for the Irish and Italians, it's similar too. Um, to say we're I don't not know how many people saw how many people have here have seen the, the Sopranos so back when I was writing the book the Sopranos was, you know, was and if you haven't famous, seen it. most famous show on television it was yeah. like you know all these series that have come since the Sopranos you haven't you're lucky the, you can start from the beginning it's like the model like that was the first time that was like you know it was like a, a, a you know a cable series yeah. like HBO series could be like that lofty, right? That ambitious. So the Sopranos is the model. And there is a famous, there's an episode there where Tony Soprano in his completely, you know, self-serving way is talking about, he's trying to, in a way, like indirectly justify his way of life to his family. And he's talking about all these injustices that have been done to Italian Americans. And among other things, he mentioned Sacco and Vanzetti, which is really funny. He says, it won't, that what they did to Sacco and Vanzetti. So I thought that was, that was like, you know, this this really takes it all takes it all the way takes it all the way back. Um, but yeah, this this is a part of the history, right? Um, it also has to do with how people remember the case. And in fact, among I didn't write about it so much in the book, but others have uh, touched on this a little bit. Um, among the Italian American community, there is a lot of ambivalence about the case. Uh, a lot of the you know even today the historical memory is not always very clear about it. There are a lot of people who were involved whose descendants don't even know about it. They never really talked about it in the family. Um, you know, Vanzetti didn't have descendants, but Sacco did, right? His son and his daughter grew up and had children and they had families and it was, people did reports on them over the years and it was, it's a, it's a family tragedy. I mean, we, we talk about it as history and the political side and the global side, and, but for them it was, their father was executed. Um, at age 32, at eight, well, he was 30, he was 36 when he was executed, right? Um, <clears throat> and he had two children and they then had children and they never really talked about it in the family because it was such a painful taboo subject. In addition to that, the guy was an anarchist and, not, you know, the descendants don't necessarily want to talk about anarchism, right? Because they're living conventional American lives. So that's another way, a more minor and maybe, um, elegiac way, if you will, of how the 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 affair plays out over the years. Yeah, I, you know, on on the also on the topic of today, I mean, this is only semi semi related, but um, I took students in my other class to the North End uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually before the election, and I, I could not get over this sort of silly silly fact that in two barber shops and uh, just walking by outside. And also um, in uh, in Regina's Pizza, we went to go pick up pizza and eat it at a park. Fox News was on. Fox News was on everywhere, all over the uh, all over the North End. Um, and so I was I was curious to see. I meant to look after the election, you know, and you look at results, how the North End went uh, and how it voted. Because just walking around, I didn't see really signage, political signage either way. But Fox News was on everywhere <laughs> which really uh which really sort of uh sort of surprised me so if there's no if there's no more um uh student questions and and by all means you can ask students a final question um i will if not i will ask the final question because it gives me a chance to show off um uh some photos i took over the weekend so i live as you guys have heard a thousand times by now uh in west roxbury 
and which is not at all far from Dedham, from the Dedham courthouse. And, um, and so I went with my son over the weekend to, um, can you see that? So we'll start with this. Oh, that's my cute son. You see the courthouse? So that's the courthouse. That is the monument and my cute son. Uh, and, and this is the monument that, um, uh, that they put up in 2007, 17, excuse me, that just says, in this historic courthouse, the trial of Niccolo, uh, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti took place in 1921. Um, you can all see it, right? And, you know, the, <laughs> the funny thing about this is how little it says, right? I mean, all it says is, this happened here. It makes no moral judgment. It makes no political judgment. It has no, it, it doesn't even say what it is. Um, it just says that this happened here. Um, and I was wondering if, if you thought that this, that, that this was conscious, if this was just maybe just sort of the historical society's desire to, to put something up, to say something important happened in Dedham, probably the only important thing to ever happen in Dedham. Um, or, um, but it still requires a sort of an active effort to not address anything, right? I was wondering if you thought this would be con what's conscious. Yeah, you know, if you, there's we, random memorialization of the case and of Sacco and Lanzetti in and around Boston, in various places, like where the defense committee had its office in Hanover Street, there's a plaque there, and there's brand, you know, the Dedham, inside the Dedham Court, they also have like on on the wall, uh, like a, a plaque, which actually does imply at least that there was like some pathos to this and some meaning to this. <clears throat> but I think overall, it's because they don't know exactly what to say. It's not. It's not like this is a clear, you're like, if you're commemorating slavery, okay, or if you're commemorating a really, you know, something which is what in, in a very sort of a clear way um, uh, looked at, un, you know, denounced and unfavorably, right? So it can be the site of a, of, of a lynching or something, something which we would all sort of just would not be a debate about. I think that's different from this case because this case was never fully resolved. Um, because as we talked about earlier, we don't know if they did it or not. We do know, I will say this, we do know that the, the trial was no good. And that, yeah. that, I'm, that I have no problem saying. I mean, if anybody here is interested in like law, it, it, whether they did it or not is a separate question from did they get a fair trial? And I do not think they, they didn't, I'm not gonna say I do not think, they did not get a fair trial. Yeah. Okay. And was, and it was, as I said before, it was suffused with political hostility in the context that we talked about, right? That, that part is clear. Um, but this is not a clear cut case that has been like judged by history in a definitive way that then we can then put up a plaque saying, here is the site of an injustice that, or you could, you know, conversely, you might say, you know, here's a site of a triumph of justice where, you know, that that's not, it's neither here nor there. So I think what they're doing is they're doing, they're just saying, as you point out, something important happened here. Yeah. <laughs> and well, and they also, it's also, but they're saying something important happened here, but not something that we're like proud of. Right. It, it's not, it it's, happened. <laughs> it happened. We don't. We don't think it's good. Well, yeah. we don't think it's bad. It happened. Yeah. We're not like we're not, we're not trumpeting it out into the world because it's not like we were amazing. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you will look at it a little bit like, um, I mean, it's completely different. But one comparison I'd make is, um, you know, there's war memorials. In war memorials, uh, most of them are you know glorify the war effort. You know, these statues of soldiers. But sometimes you have like the Vietnam War Memorial, which I'm sure many of you have visited. It's a sad place. It, it's it's a it's a melancholy place. It's very moving, but it doesn't actually say anything. It's not like yeah. there's no statement, explicit statement about this was a, a a glorious war or this was a bad war. It's just commemorating the the, the dead. Yeah, um, I have to so thank you so much. I have to interrupt you because we I want to give the trivia question before everybody drops off. Oh, right. Some, some are going on to their own things. So on to the next class. So I will post it on Canvas. 
but let me give it to you. The question is for this beautiful mug, the question is what is, there is a direct connection between Sacco and Vanzetti and Donald Trump. Okay, not like a metaphorical, like a, a physical connection, right? Not, I'm not talking about thematic, but physical connection. So tell me what that is. How, how, is, how are they connected um, by, by, by a physical place? Um, and with that, thank you, Professor Temkin, so much. It was really wonderful. Um, I, I really enjoyed it, and I know the students did too. I hope they did. I uh, know they did for sure. See, this is my favorite part. If you look in the chat, all the thank yous roll in as people are, are checking out to their next class. Um, but it was thank really you. great. And no, thank really you all. It was, it, was, it was very, it was great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And um, yeah, if, if anybody has any questions or anything like that, don't don't be shy. Send them send them along, and I'll and I'll you know happy to happy to respond. That would be great. Now have have a nice have a nice Cote du Rhone, maybe uh, Gigonda or something, and and uh, have a siesta before getting your kids. Your 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 fantasy life is very active today. I can see. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. my fantasy life is always active, especially yeah. when it comes to other people in other countries. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Keep it going because fantasies are like that's the that's the recipe for a good life. And, and, and then go get your kids. But you'll you get, get the glass of wine and the siesta in first. I will, I will. All right. All right. Take care, Moshe. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.